Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest of uh, Phil Fisher's Privacy Webinar Series. My name is Renzo Marchini, and I'm a partner in the Data and Privacy team in London. Thank you so much for joining us. <clears throat> Today's webinar focuses on cookies, and the time it is prompted by some recent developments, which we will cover, namely the latest in Belgium on the IAB's Transparency and Consent Framework, the TCF. Also, the EDBB's task force report on cookie banners. I will also include some observations on enforcement trends in some key countries. I'm therefore joined by colleagues in three of our offices to give you an international flavour. First up will be Stefan Zimbrich, a partner in our Hamburg office, who will be telling us about the IB's action plan for TCF and the Belgian authorities' reaction to it, and is smiling at my feeble attempt to pronounce his, his surname. Then will be Natalie Barnfield, I can do better with her name, a director in our London team, uh, who will talk to us about the EDPB report. Last but not least, when we cover the, in the country development, Stefan and Natalie will be joined by 16 Cruzet, an associate based in our Belgium office, but covering France. We'll finish uh, within the hour, that is by 5 p.m. London time, um, and before we get on to the substance, I have a few housekeeping points about the webinar. Please do ask us questions using the question function on your screen. We'll try and take them at convenient points as we go through, and we've also allowed for some time at the end. And if we haven't got time, then we will answer them in writing. Um, next week, we'll send you a copy of our slides, indeed, even a recording, and that also will be posted on our YouTube channel, so you don't have to scribble down too much as we go along. A couple of other last points before continuing. Do please subscribe to our blog, which has a regular set of posts on topical issues, and also to our YouTube channel. So then, to the next, uh, to the first substantive slide, and I'm going to start off by giving us a recap of the um, the legislative and regulatory landscape. So the cookie rule, as so-called cookie rule, is set out in Article 5.3 of the ePrivacy Directive uh, from 2002, and it states that you must get consent to the storage of information on a user's device or access of information on a user's device. It's called a cookie rule, but it's wider than that. Of course, a traditional cookie is the storage of a text file by the browser instigated by the publisher website on the laptop of a smart device. But it also includes access of information already there, not stored by the particular publisher, such as a device ID. Now, there's two exemptions to it in the e-privacy directive, as a lot of you, or not all of you will know. First of all, one uh, first exemption is when the storage or access is necessary for the sole purpose of transmitting a communication. And the classic example of that is a load balancing cookie used to make sure that the correct server responds to the correct device. The second exemption, which is that where the particular storage or access is strictly necessary to provide a service explicitly requested by a user. And a classic example of that is something such as storage of a language preference, which the user has requested. Now, consent, of course, is now to GDPR standards, freely given, specific, informed, unambiguous with an affirmative action, no pre tooked boxes, please. There are some important CJEU decisions, um, ranging from, uh, from about 2018-2019, from memory. Um, the, the one I want to sort of quickly mention is Fashion ID case, which looked at social plugins implemented on a website, in that particular case Facebook, by um, uh, but by the publisher of Fashion ID, and it found that the processing um, that was there of the personal data was on a joint basis. So the publisher was equally responsible for the placing of the cookie. Um, so there's lots of joint responsibility. So the consent obligation can't just be delegated out to in that case, the social plugin, the website is also responsible potentially for the uh, for the placing of the cookie. 
Now, the e-privacy directive and GDPR sit side by side and cookies information is subject to Article 5.3 is often, if not always, personal data and both regimes will apply. In 2019, there was an opinion from the European Data Protection Board on that interaction and basically restated what I think a lot of people would have known is that the specialist rules in e-privacy directive will take priority over such things as a discussion on legal basis. So the lex specialis trumps the more general rule of the GDPR. Now, there's a complex web of member state law and guidance with divergent approaches. You know, to give you a flavor of it, some countries, Italy, will treat analytics cookies as purely exempt. Many other countries will not do that. Some countries, the UK, will say it's within scope of the consent requirement, but um, we treat them benignly because they're not particularly privacy egregious. Now, that all flows, that divergence from the fact that we're talking about the transposition of a directive with no one-stop shop. Um, but there is a slow progress of a reform towards a regulation. It's been in the pipeline for a bunch of years now. The e-privacy regulation is still stalled. So please don't ask me in the chat function when we can expect it to hit the statute book because I just don't know. <laughs> I don't think anyone does. Um, so with no further ado, I'll hand us over, having set the scene, to Stefan. Thank you. Thank you, Renzo, um, for setting the scene and give us that recap about the regulatory landscape. I now come to a bit of more specific industry um, uh, regulation um, that is the IAB TCF. Um, what is the TCF? It is a transparency and constant framework, a combination of policies and technical specification that has been designed to address certain privacy issues that regularly arise in the programmatic advertising sphere. Programmatic advertising usually involves a huge number of different players involved in an advertising transaction, which is why it is difficult for websites and tech vendors to comply with all the transparency requirements and to satisfy um, all the individual requirements imposed by the GDPR, the e-privacy directive, and the regulatory guidance. Um, on this side, slide here, you see a typical consent um, mechanism that you may have encountered um, on different websites um, that is in line with the TCF. Um, the TCF involves um, mandatory purpose descriptions um, so that everyone um, uses the same language across the ecosystem. Um, it involves a list of vendors in the concept mechanism so that it becomes transparent to which parties personal data may be disclosed in the process of an ad transaction. Um, and it also includes a technical element, which is the so-called constant string. Um, it's a, well, a, a daisy chain piece of data, which includes um, information for each and any vendor that participates in the TCF and the legal basis for the different purposes that are available for that particular vendor in any given ad transaction. The TCF has become a standard in Europe um, during the last four years, um, but it has now become under particular scrutiny because of a proceeding by the Belgian Data Protection Authority, APD. And if we move on to the next slide, we will see what the APD has to say about the TCF. Um, according to the regulator, to the supervisory authority in, in Belgium, the TCF is unfortunately not compliant with the GDPR requirements. Um, the Belgians held that it does not provide sufficient transparency because the processing purposes are too generic and not specific enough. And because of the typically very large number of vendors that are included in a consent dialogue, um, often more than 300, um, that transparency cannot be satisfied. 
they also held that um, the current form of the TCF um, is not compliant with the consent requirements. Um, again, the purpose descriptions are not specific enough. Um, therefore, consent is not informed and um, it's not as easy to provide consent as it is to withdraw consent or, or the other way around, apologies. Um, there are also a couple of um, purposes, processing purposes under the TCF where it is possible to rely on legitimate interests instead of consent. And also in this field, the APD holds that um, it's not possible to use the TCF to rely on legitimate interests because it's too unspecific and um, the data subject could not reasonably expect um, the disclosure of the information to so many vendors. You, you see it, it's all repeating itself a bit. So it's about specific description of processing activities, specific description of pur purposes, and also the, the very high complexity of the consent that is sought via these mechanisms and the high number of vendors um, involved in um, this process. Um, this in the view of the regulators is an issue that needs to be addressed. Even more importantly and more fundamentally, the APD also holds that the IAB Europe um, as the issuer of the um, TCF and the managing organization of the TCF is a joint controller with the constant management platforms, CMPs. These are the technology providers that serve the constant dialogue and the technology behind it uh, with publishers and with vendors for the collection of personal data in consent strings and the subsequent processing of personal data by these parties. These last items um, have attracted a lot of criticism um, and also have been made the main part of the appeal of IAB Europe before the Belgian Market Court and have now been referred to the European Court of Justice for further discussion. If we look at the next slide, we will see on the timeline um, how this developed. So the APD's original decision is now already more than a year ago. Um, and IAB Europe immediately um, filed an appeal. And um, as part of the decision, um, IAB Europe also had to submit an action plan to mitigate and resolve the concerns um, of the APD. They submitted that to the APD um, and at the same time pursued their appeal before the Belgian Market Court. Um, so IAB Europe basically took a two-fold approach. Um, so they complied with the APD ruling on the one side. On the other side, they took legal steps to, well, get this out of the way. The result is that parts of the APD ruling are now pending before the ECJ and um, the other, um, uh, well, yeah, the other part of the um, process, so the, the action plan has just now been suspended by the IAB um, given that the decision of the um, ECJ is still pending and we do not exactly know when the ECJ will decide the case. Stefan, we do have a question which is pertinent to what you just said, actually, that's yes, come through, sure. which is, do we have a knowledge of what the content, substantive content of the action plan is? Yes, we we have, but um, it's, uh, well, a bit confidential, so um, I'm, <laughs> I'm not at liberty to, to speak uh, into too much detail, but um, what I can say is that um, for the purpose of the action plan, IAB Europe accepted the position of um, the APD that the consent string constitutes personal data and that IAB Europe is a joint controller for the processing of the consent string data. Um, but at the same time, they made very clear in the action plan that they accepted this position under protest um, and only um, to, well, move things forward. Yeah, I hand so, over to Natalie now for uh, the report on the Cookie Banner Task Force. Thank you, Stefan. So that, that takes me on um, 
nicely to another interesting development on the subject of cookies, which is the EDPB's report published in January of this year on the work of the Cookie Banner Task Force. So just by way of recap for those that aren't familiar, um, the Cookie Banner Task Force was set up by the EDPB to help to find common ground positions on the implementation of the cookie rules across the EEA. So the report essentially considers seven different cookie banner practices and how different EEA supervisory authorities would view those practices under their local implementation of the rules. Um, the substance of the report perhaps um, to many won't be surprising, but I think it's still helpful for those that are sort of designing cookie banners that are being used across number, a number of territories in the EEA. So just to cover um, those seven practices in some more detail, the first practice that was considered was not having a reject button within the first layer of the banner. So in other words, not having a button that allows the user to reject cookies, refuse cookies, or I should say refuse non-essential cookies, and whether that in, in itself constitutes an infringement of the e-privacy directive rules. And this is actually one practice, interesting, interestingly, where there was some disagreement across supervisory authorities. So according to the report, the vast majority of authorities will consider that not having such a button on the in, in the first layer will constitute an infringement of the rules but there were a few um, authorities that didn't think that that alone would constitute an infringement and didn't actually think that the EPD explicitly required that although there was an acknowledgement that if the user didn't proactively agree or consent to cookies to non-essential cookies that they'd have to be sort of um, switched off by default. So the next practice that was considered was pre-ticked boxes. And um, as Renzo's already alluded to, perhaps no surprises here, all of the task force members agreed that any practice that involved displaying cookie um, categories with pre-ticked boxes would not constitute a compliant approach. The third practice was actually um, link design or deceptive link design. And I think this can essentially be summarized as hiding or not drawing sufficient attention to the means by which users can actually refuse cookies. So the task force here gave some examples of links which provided users with um, the means to, off to refuse or opt out of cookies, but where those links are um, you know, included within bodies of text or even displayed outside of the realms of the cookie banner itself without sufficient visual prompts being brought, um, prompts being drawing attention to those specific links. So again, these sorts of practices, the task force all agreed um, would not be compliant. The fourth and fifth practices, they were considered together and that's the practice of deceptive button colors and deceptive button contrasts. Um, now, on this, the task force members agreed that it wasn't their place to impose standard designs, colours or contrasts um, for, you know, for cookie banner designs and that each cookie banner would ultimately need to be viewed on a case by case basis. But they recognised that there were a number of practices that ultimately resulted in the accept button or um, the kind of I agree or I consent button being highlighted or being nudged over the alternative option. And so what the task force did agree on was that the perhaps extreme example of offering an opt out button where the text um, was not sufficient, the, the color of the text or the contrast and color of the text and the background color was not sufficient so that the text was barely readable. There was agreement that that particular type of practice wouldn't um, be compliant. Perhaps no surprises, quite an extreme example. Um, the next practice was, that was considered was reliance on legitimate interests for subsequent processing. And for this, there was quite a specific use case or scenario that was considered. And it was the scenario where a banner essentially presents the user with the option to to accept or consent to the reading or writing of cookies within the first layer of the banner and then sought to rely on legitimate interests for the subsequent processing of personal data within the second layer. Now, with respect to this particular type of scenario, this particular practice, the task force made two observations. The first was that if the banner hadn't obtained valid consent for the reading or writing of cookies within the first layer, 
perhaps because the banner was designed in such a way that users didn't really have a genuine choice to refuse. Then the subsequent processing of personal data on legitimate interest grounds would not be compliant with the GDPR. Um, perhaps no surprises, but it, it was quite a specific use case that they were considering. And the second point or second observation that they made was the lawful basis for the processing of personal data in connection with that first aspect, i.e. the reading or writing of cookies, could not be legitimate interests under the GDPR. And that's because, as Renzo reiterated at the beginning of the session, um, because that particular practice would trigger a consent requirement under the e-privacy directive. The next practice was the inaccurate classification of essential cookies. And this is something that, that, that we always see. Um, if you do have a, have a look through um, in any detail, the kind of categorization of cookies. And on this, the task force sort of recognized some of the challenges of, of the practical challenges of keeping on top of all of the cookies that are being used on a website at any given moment. And they recognized that because of this, there was value to relying on tools to help you um, generate reports about what cookies were being used. But they also all agreed that website operators shouldn't be relying on those tools to categorize their cookies um, and sort of implied that they, they had been incorrectly cl classifying cookies as being essential or strictly necessary and therefore outside of the consent requirements and that the ultimately it was up to the website operator to, to make this proper determination. And then finally, the task force also considered the practice of not offering a persistent withdrawal icon that's visible and hovering on all pages of the website, which essentially allows the data subject to um, resurface their cookie privacy settings. So again, much like on the observations relating to deceptive button colors and deceptive button contrast, the task force basically said, it's not our place to impose a specific standard for withdrawal solutions, in particular, this notion of a hovering icon that's persistent across web pages. But they did all agree that it was the website owner's responsibility to put in place an easily, accept, easily accessible solution, which allows users to withdraw their consent at any time, which very much does sound like something similar to the withdrawal icon, icon that they were referring to in the first part of their analysis. So I think for, in summary on this point is that while they were sort of um, giving folks a pat on the back for the likes of using for, the, for using the likes of a withdrawal icon, they didn't they agreed that they couldn't explicitly require the withdrawal mechanism to take that particular form. And that's my summary of the EDPB report on the Cookie Banner Task Force. And I think now we're moving on to some country developments in uh, the order of France, Germany and UK. So over to you, Sixteen. Thank you. Thank you, Renzo. So for France, it's been fairly busy um, over the last three years. Um, as you all know, uh, or most, most of you know, um, the French Data Protection Authority, the CNIL, adopted a very extensive and detailed guidance in 2020, so three years ago. And since then, um, they adopted a very um, active and even proactive approach when it comes to enforcement. And that's why now we can say that it's, it has been the most um, active enforcer of cookie rules in the EU. Why is that? Because they, they set up front, they announced it very clearly that they would devote extra resources uh, to handle complaints regarding cookies and to enforce rules. And so they, they uh, spend uh, more resources to investigate companies and specifically uh, using online investigations. Um, and now we see that we have a number of sanctions that are accumulating, especially against big tech. I'm sure you, you heard about the the sanctions against uh, Apple, um, uh, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, etc. We are going to have a look at them in a minute. Um, but before that, I wanted to have some key takeaways about these sanctions. Uh, what we can see clearly is that the, um, the CNIL is only applying and exclusively applying the e-privacy directive. And why is that? Um, it, it wants to basically um, um, 
it, it wants to avoid the application of the GDPR, not to uh, rely on the one-stop shop mechanism. Because as you know, under the one-stop shop mechanism, uh, most of the times when you enforce the, the GDPR against big tech companies, it would be the Irish um, Data Protection Authority that would be competent. But in the case of the e-privacy directive, as soon as you are a company uh, dropping uh, a cookie on, on the device of a user located in France, the CNIL uh, considers itself competent under um, national law. And therefore, that's why they were able to um, issue um, that many decisions against big tech, only relying on, on the, on the e-privacy directive. Um, another takeaway that we see is that um, all these sanctions put um, a lot of pressure on website publishers. Um, we can see that the CNIL does not really go after um, ad tech intermediaries or providers of third-party cookies. It really focus, um, focuses on, on, on website publishers, mostly because we have a, um, a growing number of complaints directly against website publishers, but also because it's very easy to, um, for the CNIL to conduct an online investigation. Very practically speaking, the CNIL would just go on your website take uh, screenshots and then it's 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 easy for them and relatively less costly to identify infringements and it doesn't have to um, carry out um, an on-premise or on-site um, investigation. Um, so we see all this pressure on website publishers and maybe a prime example of that uh, also relates to Google Analytics. As you know, around uh, yeah one year ago, the, the CNIL um, issued a number of orders directly against um, website publishers, asking them to um, stop transferring data uh, using Google Analytics to Google in the US. And in doing so, the CNIL uh, refused to, to go after Google. It went only um, uh, after the, the website publishers. Uh, so we see this pressure. And then if we go to the next slide, um, here I set out a timeline of the the past and the recent uh, enforcement. So you will recognize some big names. Uh, we see that there were sanctions against um, uh, Google, um, uh, Facebook, um, Microsoft, TikTok. Um, so we have all these sanctions against big tech and uh, they, these are mostly uh, huge fines, but also they are combined with uh, injunctions to comply within um, a short period of time, usually three months. And then if the company does not comply within three months, they would be subject to a, a daily penalty. And next to that, we have also several waves um, of enforcement that the CNIL uh, did not make public, but we know that the CNIL sent almost 100 um, orders to different website publishers asking them to comply within one month and the result was pretty efficient because most of these uh, these companies uh, complied um, uh, very very quickly um, uh, so, so we've seen these different waves of enforcement and uh, and the, this large-scale um, enforcement campaign now if we go to the next slide um, when we look um, at the decisions we we can actually list four main types of um, uh, infringements that the CNIL found um, and you will see some overlap with what uh, natalie described uh, in the edpb uh, task force uh, report first um, the CNIL um, often finds that um, basically when users land or start browsing a website there's no user consent uh, and cookies are non-essential cookies are automatically dropped. Um, this is due to the fact that there's no CMP or um, the, the website is automatically inferring consent um, from the further browsing. So we know that it's it's not um, it's not okay. Then the second type of infringement is that even if there is a CMP and a user rejects um, the non-essential cookies then the website would still drop uh, cookies despite um, the user re refusal. And then a third type of infringement, but also very, uh, very important because it's really the main one that the CNIL um, has found um, in the previous decisions, is that it's not allowing uh, users to reject cookies as easily as, um, as they can consent to it. Um, so it was the first type of infringement that Natalie um, described. Um, so on the on the first layer of the cookie banner, um, you should have an accept and a reject button, at least in France. Um, other authorities uh, do not agree. 
Um, and we know that in this respect, the CNIL was really a driver um, and pushed for stricter requirements within the EDPB task force because it has uh, stricter views. And then a last, um, a last type of infringement relates to information. Uh, the fact of not informing that users have a right to reject cookies or not informing about uh, cookie, cookie purposes. So we have these four types of infringement and what is a bit striking is when you compare these broad infringements to, uh, with the, um, the CNIL guidance, well the CNIL guidance is much more detailed and it goes into, um, uh, you know, into detail regarding the design of the CMP, how long consent should be valid, etc. But for now, the CNIL has, um, I would say, um, uh, um, adopted not superficial sanctions, but he, it focused mainly on these broad uh, infringements, but it didn't go into detail and it did not apply um, its full recommendations. So that's one thing. And now, well, I guess the good news is that we're, we're, we're coming to an end um, and it's the end of the um, enforcement cycle for cookies. It was announced very recently uh, by the CNIL uh, earlier this month. Um, this means that they will devote less resources um, for, the, for cookie cases, but there is still a risk of enforcement if you do not comply with at least this, uh, these requirements. For instance, if there's a complaint, you're still at risk um, of um, being subject to a fine. But there's a new uh, regulatory focus as of this year regarding mobile apps. And here we are going to see the same, uh, the same story again. So um, it will be equivalent to what the CNIL did for cookies. The CNIL uh, is now trying to get a view of how the market is functioning, uh, discussing with stakeholders. Then next, the next step would be for the CNIL to adopt some guidance like it did for cookies. And then the last step would be um, a targeted or large-scale large enforcement campaign. So the shift will be more focused on uh, tracking users via mobile apps, for instance, um, through the SDKs. Um, so for here, a practical, um, a practical recommendation that we can make is that you should still audit your websites um, to ensure that you're still compliant regarding cookie rules, especially for this, these four types of enforcement of uh, infringements. And then for mobile apps, you should monitor any upcoming guidance and, and maybe start auditing your, your mobile apps, how many trackers you are using, how to classify them, etc. How do you get the consent? Wait for the CNIL guidance, and then uh, then we can uh, we can uh, take it from there. Thank you. Yeah, let's thank you, and let's have a look at, at German developments now. Um, in Germany too, we saw um, quite detailed regulatory guidelines. Um, the first version had been issued in end of 2021, has recently been updated. Similarly to what we saw in France, it's it's very detailed um, and it puts a lot of scrutiny on third-party tracking in general. So German regulators are much more relaxed if you use technology or tools um, where the data only goes to the website provider. But as soon as you employ um, tools where um, also third parties obtain data and, and process data, then uh, regulators um, are, well, much more uh reluctant to give it green lights um the same applies to the well storing of unique identifiers in cookies so it's for a german regulator it's often okay if you use cookies to store like screen resolution or um, the color of uh, a font for instance um, but as soon as you use unique ids to recognize the same device again in a later browsing session then that often is the well that there are you you are crossing the border where you're not placing necessary cookies anymore you need consent and where you have all these consent requirements that we've been discussing in the context of the tcf and a bit surprisingly um the same principles also should apply to cmp providers so consent management platforms so even if a cookie is stored just to record the user's consent decision, the um, authorities say, well, it's still not a necessary cookie. It needs consent for the CMP to do so, which, as I said, comes across a bit surprising. Um, different to France, um, German authorities have been very reluctant to issue fines. Um, this maybe a bit part of the German more consensual culture. Um, there have been a lot of 
proceedings and investigations though um, and, and contact with regulators um, um, but usually um, the these have been resolved by just well websites having changed their um, consent mechanisms um, having provided more information having um, uh, offered uh, an opt-out um, or reject button on the first layer of the consent mechanism and so on um, rarely we saw fines um, another focus and that is also something that I believe is a bit German specific is that German uh, regulators um, expect website providers to enter into joint controller agreements with tech vendors um, so third parties that drop cookies on the website um, this is in the view of the German regulator a consequence of the planet 49 and fashion ID rulings um, and in Germany that has been enforced on a fairly broad basis more interestingly I believe is the development in the area of civil enforcement though um, so uh, in Germany um, you can go to a civil court either as an individual or as a consumer protection association um, and um, claim a breach of privacy regulation this has led to many cases um, in the civil before the civil courts where privacy advocates pursued um, cases against ad tech vendors um, and a very dangerous attack we saw a lot recently is that they go after a vendor, so not after a publisher, go after a tech vendor um, that would place its cookies through publisher websites and requests to seize and desist from the dropping of cookies on these websites without, not on these specific websites generally, to seize and desist from dropping cookies without proper consent. Um, because a vendor has no means of controlling how consent is sought on a website um, and also no means to differentiate a particular individual from another um, that theoretically could result in a court order that would essentially force a vendor to seize and desist from dropping cookies generally across Germany or across Europe depending on the legal reasoning that sits behind that ruling. Um, we also saw tactical targeting of consent management platforms um, when these platforms use either US-based cloud services such as AWS or Azure um, or GCP um, or even content delivery networks, so-called CDNs that are used to, to have an edge server close to the individual user if that CDN also is of US origin and the, well, the target well, the attacks here were based on the Schrems 2 ruling alleging that any use of a US based cloud service or any use of a US based CDN um, would involve necessarily the transfer of data to the US. There are a couple of practical measures you can take to mitigate the risk although you may not be able to completely exclude it but um, for vendors um, it is something we usually recommend that you would do steps to audit compliance um, if you have publisher partners you can do so automatically by using crawlers that check the website against certain implementation requirements or you can use questionnaire based audits um, there are other measures you can take but we believe it's now the point in time where it's necessary also for vendors that drop third-party cookies through websites to demonstrate a certain well compliance measure regime um, so that it, at least to show that you do more than nothing thank you over to Renzo and Natalie so over thank Natalie. you Stefan yeah I'm going to cover developments in the UK and it's actually really interesting to be able to contrast the different approaches that are taken to um, cookie compliance across Germany and France and the UK because whilst I should for completeness I should completeness I should also say that in the UK we also have detailed guidance from the ICO on the use of cookies and similar technologies um, and whilst we also know of cookie practices being considered or investigated by the ICO there there's currently little in the way of enforcement action that's been taken in the UK um, that we can sort of point to and certainly um, nothing like uh, the 
types of enforcement that we're seeing in France. We do have um, the ICO strategy paper for 2022-2023 um, called ICO 25 and it does actually refer to online tracking as being one of the ICO's priorities for this, for this particular period but it refers to the ICO looking to work with government, industry and other regulators to give users more meaningful control over how they're tracked and specifically um, it notes moving away from cookie pop-ups. So that message is quite an interesting one and it is one that seems to align to an extent with the objectives of the UK's D Data Protection and Digital Information Bill. Um, so many of you, I'm sure, will already be aware uh, aware of this and familiar with this, but for those that aren't, um, this bill was actually reintroduced to Parliament just earlier this month and proposes to make a number of changes to UK data protection law. And one of its key object objectives is um, cited as being to cut down pointless paperwork for business and to reduce annoying cookie pop-ups. Um, so how does that translate in practice? Well, in terms of the actual changes that are being proposed to the UK rules, um, first, the bill proposes to align fines for infringement um, to those that are to infringement of the cookie rules or the rules pertaining to cookies and similar technologies to those that are set out under the UK GDPR. In other words, um, the greater of 4% of worldwide turnover or 17.5 million pounds. So currently the fine thresholds that are available to the ICO for infringement of the cookie rules is only 500,000 pounds. So secondly, the bill proposes to introduce a number of exemptions to the requirement to obtain consent to the use of cookies and similar technologies. Um, specifically, where cookies are being used to understand the way that services or websites are used in order to improve them, that's the first. And on that particular point, um, there is a condition that there is, you are not able to share data for these purposes so, sorry, shared data that's collected for these purposes with any third party unless that third party is also using the data in order to improve your service. So that's the condition that applies to the first exemption. The second exemption is essentially uses that facilitate the display of a user's web of a website on a user's device in light of a user's particular preferences. Um, so the language preference example that Renzo used at the beginning of the session might be one that falls within scope here, or otherwise uses that enhance the appearance or functionality of a website on the user's device. The third is um, cookie uses to enable software updates for security purposes, um, perhaps not a surprise there. And then lastly, um, uses that help to determine the geographical location of a user or, or an individual in an emergency situation. Now, in most cases, um, with actually the exception of the last example, the emergency example, um, there's also a requirement to ensure that you're providing users with notice of these uses and um, providing users with the ability to opt out or express an objection to those, use, to those uses. So this, that's the summary of the changes that are being um, made to the cookie rules in the UK. For the time being, we're more or less still aligned um, with the approach taken in Europe, with the exception perhaps of our approach to enforcement. And Thank you, Natalie. Actually, I've got a question on um, here, actually, which I, you, you could possibly take, which is um, the EDPP uh, task force on cookie consent banners that we talked about earlier. Um, mm. How does that relate to the UK, obviously no longer subject to EU regime, um, the UK ICO's attitude to the similar issues? Yeah, so obviously the UK didn't participate within the cookie banner task force specifically, but I think it's probably fair to say that all of the sort of common grounds that were reached under that report um, were perhaps unsurprising and I, I suspect that the ICO would likely take a similar position on all of the kind of common positions that are established under that report. Um, certainly we haven't had anything from the ICO to suggest that they would take a, they'd specifically take a different approach um, to any of those particular practices that were considered. 
Great. Thank you, Natalie. Oh, a couple of questions coming. So one for 16, actually, um, before we move on. Um, Canil seems to have gone for big tech companies. You, you, you made that point. What's the position, do you think, for small companies? And so that ties into the point that you made also, I think, about um, no longer an enforcement priority for them. Are small companies now safe? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, so when we look at the previous enforcement, um, we see that there, there are um, some enforcement cases, but they were not made public. So I mentioned all the waves of um, formal notices, so all these orders that the CNIL sent. We know that they also targeted um, uh, big companies, but also medium or, or small companies, depending on the traffic of their website. So if a website um, has more traffic, it's more at risk because the CNIL set up a lab which basically allows to monitor the, the website um, which, ha which have uh, uh, more traffic. Um, so they, they focus on, uh, on this kind of websites. Uh, and so it's regardless of the type of, um, of companies. And then a second point, we, we also saw several fines. Um, I put them in the timeline um, in the previous slide, but we, we also had some sanctions against um, French companies or European companies such as Brico, uh, Le Figaro. Um, so not huge companies, but in this case, the, took, the CNIL took a very proactive stance because the initial investigation did not relate to cookies, but in the middle of the investigation, the CNIL decided to extend the scope of the investigation to cookies. So it really wanted to, uh, to sanction um, other types of companies, not only big tech um, in this sphere. And then for the future, um, same answer, I think a small or medium-sized company are not completely um, off the hook. Um, it really depends on you know, how much tra uh, tracking they, they implement on their mobile apps. Right, thanks, Sixteen. Um, one last question, then maybe we can move on to another slide. Um, Natalie, just by the way, I, I, I think the viewers are seeing a blank slide at the moment, but maybe that's deliberate. Yes. But anyway, let me, let, me, let me read the next question whilst um, you ponder that. Um, with web beacons being increasingly used in marketing emails, are these the kind of technologies that should be explained in cookie notices? even though they're not strictly cookies and will not appear on the owner's domain as they appear in the inbox of the user. Um, I suppose any of us could answer that. Shall, shall, shall I have a go <laughs> since you guys have been doing most of the talking? Um, you, you, you know, there's no requirement to have a cookie notice. There's a requirement to be transparent as part of Article 5.3. Um, and if the, um, the beacon in an email is um, processing personal data or accessing information from the user's device, then there is an obligation to be transparent on that. Um, but I think it's fair to say that many, if not most companies, are very non-compliant in relation to um, the tracking of the opening of marketing emails, which probably, there's some arguments that could be made, I think, probably require consent in relation to that. Um, but consent is simply, I think, in practice, not obtained at the moment. Um, Steph and Natalie, 16, anyone want to add anything to that? No. Yeah, maybe just, uh, Renzo, in terms of enforcement, uh, in France, it's been relatively off the radar. Um, there's yeah. no regulatory focus on, on uh, web backends or invisible pixels. Okay. Thank you very much, 16. Um, one more question. What is the current view of, on the compliance um, with the legal legislative framework on Google consent mode, I think I mean Google Analytics. What's the current view on that, Stefan? Well, um, German regulators take the view that it, it doesn't make any difference. Um, so that that Google is a controller and joint controller with the website owner if you use analytics um, regardless of whether you permit all well, the use of data for Google's own purposes um, in the interface. This view I believe is well it is based on an, uh, a bit of an armchair analysis of an old version of Google Analytics that has been conducted three and a half or four years ago. Um, I am not aware of 
a more recent analysis by the regulators of the new Google Analytics um, and the differentiation school made possible um, within that new version. So that that position might not be accurate anymore and might not be up to date as well, but it still informs the view of German courts if that goes to court. That's our experience. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so uh, to the audience, we've lost our slides. We had one slide left and Stefan, you were going to be talking about industry developments and I'll read out the heading of your slide. Um, is this the end of the third party cookie era? Well, yes and no. So um, that there is a, there are basically two developments at the moment. One is the regulatory development, and we we've been covering that um, in this webinar exhaustively, I think. The other one is the technical development, and and browser manufacturers such as, as Google and Firefox and and Apple for Safari, they take steps to discontinue third-party cookies um, and it becomes increasingly difficult for technology vendors to rely on third-party cookies as the traditional mean to recognize users across the internet and across different web pages and websites. So that means that ID data, which is a fueling the ad industry, is something that becomes scarce at the moment and because of that the industry is of course looking for alternatives and one development that we see is that first party ids play an increasing role this means yes cookies are still used but they are dropped via the domain of the website owner the publisher rather than via the domain of a tech vendor at the same time this means that the ID space is limited to that particular website. So you need to align first between publisher and advertiser to use a shared ad space, a shared ID space, um, or you have to use data clean rooms to match these ID spaces if you want to do advertising. It's not that you can use one ID space or a couple of ID spaces and you have a reach of like 95% across the entire web. So that is one development that we see. At the same time, we also see that consortium IDs play an increasing role, at least for Germany, so that publishers cooperate with each other and use the same ID technology, first party ID technology, and then, well, position themselves with a joint offering towards the demand industry, towards the advertisers. Um, and um, so they are able to, like, gather a, a certain reach and, and um, provide a, a certain amount of uh, uh, traffic and, and impressions um, to the ad industry. All of these scenarios come with different regulatory challenges, of course. For instance, if you want to use a clean room, um, you would typically cooperate with a particular advertiser for a particular project when you're a publisher. Um, and that means that you would typically need to enter into a joint controller arrangement with that advertiser for that particular project where you both use the same clean room provider um, as a job data processor. Um, that is just one example. Um, we also, of course, hear about new ideas um, specifically in the from the telecommunication services provider that use their subscription-based data to um, introduce a new stable id into the ecosystem whether that will find um well agree we'll, we'll get green lights from the regulators remains to be seen thank you very much uh stefan and thank you very much natalie and 16 and stefan for your fantastic insightful presentations and thank you to the audience for joining um we're going to close a little bit early give you five minutes back in your day as I mentioned at the beginning, we will be sending slides and a link to the recording very soon. We try to give a webinar every month or so. Uh, the next one actually is on the 24th of April. Uh, Leone Power, a partner in the London team, will lead a webinar looking at the one-stop shop and in particular the fallout from the Irish DPC and EDPD's divergence of views on legal bases in the Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp decisions. 
In May, we won't be having a webinar, but we are having our first in-person four-day privacy, privacy summit in London. Uh, the first one since the pandemic, sorry. We, we took taken a break for a few years, but they've been a big highlight in uh, the privacy team's calendar for a long time. And that will be on the 18th of May. Um, I think it's getting full. If you've not yet registered your interest in attending, please do so. Um, and um, hopefully we'll see some, if not all of you there. And thank you very much for joining us. Goodbye.